Hello, welcome back. This is always one of the uh, toughest talks of the day. It's right after lunch. You're gonna be a little sleepy. We could try some things. We could maybe have this elevator go up or down. Maybe you'll wake up, the truck could drive out here. <laughs> um, if everybody is, as I uh, could squish to the middle again, um, just to leave the, the easy access seats um, for people to go and sit down. And then if you need the caffeine, it's, uh, it's still in the back there. So coffee, juice, soda. You can also just run laps back there if you need to. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick off the, the next talk. We're going to do a couple things in the afternoon here. So we have uh, two full-length talks here. Actually, we have three full-length talks. Um, and we're going to have a series of lightning talks. And the, the lightning talks are really going to be like lightning. They're going to be very fast. Um, and there's going to be uh, five in a row. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and kick off the next talk here. Um, it is going to be uh, Igor Dorovsky and Kostub Gwande uh, are going to go and, and talk to us from Expedia about mobile automation and the continuous uh, delivery pipeline. And so with that, welcome up, guys. Thank you. Just to introduce ourselves, uh, I'm Igor and he's Kostub. Oh, uh, sorry, I got that messed up. I was just checking if you guys are awake or already asleep after the lunch. OK, good. Um, so um, let's jump right into it. Um, before we get started, um, I joined Expedia in 2004. And um, how many of you have been in a situation where the number of automated tests is zero? Um, how many of you have uh, heard your business or the product team say, you engineering team, you just cannot ship fast enough. You just cannot go quickly enough. How many? Oh, not bad. OK, all right. So um, what I'm here to talk about is I heard the same things for many, many years. And I'm going to talk, we are going to talk about some of the things we have done in the last couple of years to try and address both of those situations. Um, so if you are in that situation, stay awake. It will help. Uh, so let's get right into it. So here's a graph of uh, what Expedia has done over the last uh, few years. So the, the blue bar is the number of hotfixes we used to ship, 2005. And the green bar is the number of releases we used to ship. And the, number of, the red is the number of what we call business A-B tests, where business can try different functionality on the site and let the customers decide what's right for them. Right? So in the, in the web world, that's where ev everything is going. You ship fast, you try different things, you let the customers decide. Don't assume you know what they want or what they like. And the last is my favorite, the purple one. The Expedia stock price is up twice. <laughs> I wish the stock price was up 20 times versus the releases were up only two times. But unfortunately, that's going to have to wait for a while. Um, so this is the best way to highlight what continuous delivery can do for you. right? It can help you ship faster, more releases, uh, and then ultimately make you rich. Um, so what does the agenda look like? I'm going to talk about test automation, some basics, uh, because we have a wide variety of audience here and online. And so I want to make sure we talk about the basics. Uh, we'll show you what the continuous delivery pipeline of tests looks like for Expedia. Specifically for our team, we work on the Expedia front end site. So everything you see on Expedia.com or one of the Expedia sites, it's our team that's shipping that, including mobile. We do mobile web, mobile apps. Um, and so we'll talk about a little bit about the test methodology and some of the, the, the unique things we have done in the last few years, as well as, uh, and then Igor's going to talk about the specific tools we use. Everything is, almost everything we use is, is open source. Um, so it's very cheap. Um, free. Uh, and then we'll talk about the key benefits that we have gotten as a test organization, right? So specifics on what benefits I have personally seen and measured. All right. So there's a lot of talk in the, in the industry about agile, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Most recently, if you guys are following, there's a lot of talk of DevOps. There's a whole DevOps movement going on. So this is the best slide I found out to explain what, the, what continuous delivery really means. Um, so you start, in 2006, Expedia was agile, but we didn't really have a continuous integration system in place. Well, then we fixed that. 2006 to 2009, we had continuous integration in place, didn't really have continuous delivery in place. So it's been a progression. The last few years, we've been focused on 
the continuous delivery piece. And my talk is going to be focused on the, and, and Igor's going to uh, cover up the, the, auto, the automation tools we're using, or the, the, the test automation piece of continuous delivery. Um, so it's basics. Most people know what a test automation pyramid is. What I'm here to tell you is just one simple thing. If you're serious about continuous delivery, get your test automation pyramid right. It's super critical to getting to continuous delivery, which means lots and lots, thousands, hundreds of thousands of unit tests, a small number of integration tests, and a very small number of UI or you know end-to-end -end tests, as we call them. It's super important. I'll show you a, a, a quick graph. So just over the last year, the, uh, the green is obviously the number of unit tests in, that we have added. Uh, orange is the medium or the integration test, and the red are the large tests. For a long, long time, Expedia's pyramid was inverted. We were lots of UI automated tests, some integration tests, and very few unit tests. Man, it was so difficult for a tester to catch bugs, only relying on UI automation. It was crazy. So this has been a, a huge part of you know, helping us get to continuous delivery, is get your test pyramid correct. Measure it and drive it insanely. So let's talk about the continuous delivery pipeline itself. So what does the pipeline look like? Before a developer checks in any piece of code, there are a series of pre-commit tests that they need to run. And Ari and the first talk referred to this. Uh, most of these are unit tests. They run in milliseconds, and you can run hundreds of thousands of them uh, uh, very, very quickly. Um, once, it, once it's checked in in a single branch called trunk, again, uh, the Google talk referred to this as well, single branch, all developers are checking in code in one place. We run a couple of tests, uh, sets of tests there. For the mobile team, we use JavaScript unit tests. So there's an open source tool, tool called Jasmine. We use that. There are plenty of other tools. You guys can pick what you want. Um, and then we run a series of trunk smoke tests. So what are these smoke tests? These are basic happy path functionality that a typical Xplay user would do. Search for a flight, book a flight. Search for a hotel, book a hotel, so on and so forth. So we make sure the basic functionality is working even before the build gets promoted to our, our large servers. Once it gets promoted to the, assuming the previous tests pass, it gets promoted to the, uh, to the next stage where we run a much broader set of acceptance tests. These are a little bit more involved. Search for a hotel, change the dates, click on a few things, make sure uh, like all the pry one, pry two scenarios are working. Great, those are green. Then deploy it to an environment that is very special. The, this test environment does not have any live dependencies. No live services downstream, no live connections to third parties. One of the most interesting problems Expedia has to solve uh, is we have live connections to hundreds of airlines, global distribution systems, which is where the airline fares get filed. And we have to talk to them in real time because airline avail availability and prices can change literally in seconds. I'm sure lots of people here have seen price changes all the time, right? And so we are dependent on third-party data in real time, and imagine trying to automate that. One of the most hard, hard, uh, one of the hardest problems, I think. Um, so what we do is we we mask out all those dependencies and say we're going to focus on the UI only. We're going to stub out or mock out all the dependencies so that whatever we are testing only covers the UI, and we can find things fast, the things that our devs might have broken. So we run those on the on iPhone, Android. And then we use Chrome as basically a base device. It, it covers all the other devices that are out there that are slightly older, but they are still in use in um, usually Asia Pacific countries um, and some of the European countries and things like that. So we try to cover as many of our as a customer base as possible. Keep in mind, no, none of the tests run unless the previous thing has passed and is green. All right, so some simple rules around the pipeline, right? Um, it has to be green at all times, because there are hundreds of check-ins coming in, uh, not to the scale of Google, but at least we have 400 developers we, uh, checking in every single day. The changes conflict with each other, things break. Um, so it's important that there's a certain amount of discipline in keeping the pipeline green at all times. Otherwise, you cannot get to continuous delivery. If a build breaks, which can happen, it auto-locks the branch, so no more check-ins can get in, 
let's not pollute the code base so that we can figure out which CL had, has broken the branch. And then what we do is we say, OK, if, if the build is broken, we have to fix forward in 10 minutes or less, or else the CL is going to get reverted. There is like, it's very, very like uh, low tolerance for people keeping the build broken, right? And the reason why we kept the 10, 10 minutes is we, we flirt, uh, like flirted with the idea of five minutes, 15 minutes, and all that good stuff. And what we realized is the simplest reason for a build break is when devs miss checking in a file accidentally. And it takes no more than five to 10 minutes to get the file back in and, and call it green. There's a build coach role where we rotate responsibility amongst different, te uh, different team members, developers, testers. Uh, we actually have even have PMs do this so that they understand uh, why it's important. Um, where if a build is broken, their job is to get it green in the 10 minute time frame. And what we have found is initially it used to take us five, six hours to you know, actually get builds where they need to be. But now we are down to a, a 10 minute, 15 minute interval. So we have seen some good success there. All right, so let's talk about the overall methodology that we use in, in testing. And then Igor is going to talk about the specific tools we use to cover each of these. So Expedia is a very agile company, like we, and customer is the most important thing to us. I think there is no test that you can write better than simulating exactly what the user is doing, right? And these BDD tools, um, and Igor is going to talk about a very specific tool that we use, let you simulate exactly the user actions. And the, the best part about it is you can have PMs, product managers, business team, and write them because it's written in English. You don't need any technical degrees. You don't need to be a superstar SET uh, to write the Cucumber scenarios. Your test engineers, your PMs can write them as well. When it comes to, so we use BDD mostly for UI and integration level testing because that's more user scenarios. Um, at the code level, uh, we really strongly encourage our developers to take a TDD approach. Write the test first, then write your code, and your code is not good until the test passes. We have had mixed success with this, so we're still working on getting it better. All right, you have the, all these great tests in place now, fantastic. What's next? Let's take them, put them in Jenkins, which is our build system that we use. When you include, include them in Jenkins, you, we have to make two key decisions. What is the speed of the tests that are running, and how often do you want to run them? If they are really, really fast, you can run them very often and as part of every single build. So you get lots of regression coverage. If they are really, really slow, like the large test or the UI or the end-to-end -end test, well, guess what? You're going to have to figure out whether you want to run them a few times a day or like once a week or whatever. I, so again, going back to Adi's talk this morning, he talked about the, the quadrupulation of the problem. This is why we choose to run our large test only 12 times a day, every two hours. So they do not run as part of every single build. Just to go back, uh, what that means is what you see here are all the regression test cases that run except the large tests that can take hours to run. Some of our tests take three, four hours to run. You can't put them in the build. You got to run them at a certain frequency. So we run them every two hours. All right, so you have these tests. They are in Jenkins. But again, what do you do with live dependencies? That's where you use mocking, stubbing, remove them so that you can focus on testing your code, the, th the stuff that your devs changed. Um, once you have this, you need to have visibility. People need to know what's going on with, the, with your builds, with your tests. So we use uh, some Jenkins plugins. Uh, these are called build and test radiators. We're going to show you some examples. And we also have a video of how the process works in real time uh, a little bit later. I have been in this situation way too many times. You have tests, they run, they fail, and people ignore them. They just don't care. Or they just go whatever. I mean, it's the tester's job to go take a look at them, or the automation engineer's job. So it's, again, again discipline in terms of how quickly you react to the failure and how quickly can you fix it. Again, the video will highlight how we have done it, and hopefully that will be helpful for some of you guys. So 
over to Igor. He's going to talk about the specific frameworks we are using for mobile and how it's integrated into the whole Jenkins system. Thank you, Kostub. I enjoyed the speech a lot. I hope you continue until the end. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my name is Igor. Um, I'm task lead um, engineer at Expedia for the past year. Um, um, so was in mobile department uh, like uh, second QA when I started. And I had to uh, basically solve the, what kind of tools we have to use uh, and how we can map them into the test pyramid to uh, fulfill all the problems and solve all the problems we had at that time. So uh, the, I, I try to go fast as, as fast as I can because we are limited on time. Um, there are other talks in this uh, um, conference about the specifics of, of some of these tools. But uh, what I try to focus on how it fits into the continuous delivery process. So I'll start with a uh, uh, Jasmine. So Jasmine is a, a JUnit uh, test framework. Um, we use it that uh, to basically fit it in the top of the pyramid, which is the functional um, BDD kind of, um, even though it says unit test, I still think it's a BDD um, approach uh, for testing the JavaScript. Um, so in order to run the JavaScript test in the Jenkins, we use the Jasmine gem, which is a Ruby library, uh, with the CI reporter. Uh, to generate uh, JUnit XML um, reports that helps us to draw graphs in the Jenkins um, to see how we progress over the time. Um, and uh, the good thing about Jasmine complements other UI functional tests, which is our Selenium test. And in order to write the Selenium test, uh, we're using uh, Ruby as the main language and Cucumber on top of it uh, to write our test in English. Because Tube was mentioning that it's important that uh, uh, the test has to be written uh, in a language that everybody understands, including project managers, developers, and uh, also um, QAs, obviously, right? Um, even product uh, team is looking at the test to see what kind of coverage do we have. Um, later, I will show you an example of a Cucumber scenario, so you have a better idea for those who never seen that before. We also use uh, Cucumber with uh, uh, Ruby. Uh, to write our integration uh, level test, which is the API um, test for mobile department specifically. Uh, and uh, we use a just regular HTTP library with a JSON parser. And it works very well for us. Again, it's all written in Cucumber in English, so, but it fits in the middle layer of the pyramid. That's our kind of integration test. And uh, for the low level of pyramid, we use uh, test in G. Uh, before we had the J unit, but the problem with J unit was uh, uh, it was kind of hard to parallelize all the tests, and test and G solved that problem for us. So we use test and G as our primarily unit test framework to test our platform, uh, which is a backend uh, kind of uh, platform uh, for the whole Expedia. And uh, as Kostub mentioned earlier, that it's important that the test executes fast. Right, uh, so we're not we're not going to be dependent on the live environments, and that's when uh, Easy Mock uh, we use as a mocking solution for our unit test, and for the UI test, and as well as the um, integration test, we use our custom stubbing solution. So that helps to speed our uh, test execution in the continuous uh, integration environment. Okay, so uh, the previous uh, uh, slide was actually mostly focusing on the mobile web um, and mobile web tools that we use. Um, uh, here you can see um, we also do the mobile apps as a part of our team uh, that we have to uh, test both on iOS clients and Android clients. So specifically for, um, uh, for the iOS, we use the Frank. Uh, it was the first framework that uh, we try lo started looking at last year uh, that was supporting Cucumber. Like I mentioned earlier, for us, the BDD tool Cucumber was the main focus, plus we can use Ruby. That means we can reuse a lot of our test methodology that we established before, even for native clients. And that's why Frank uh, fell to that category at that time, and we started using that. Um, the only part that it cannot test with Frank is a uh, hybrid apps. It doesn't support the web views in your uh, native applications. Um, so for the Android, we're using Robotium, 
currently, but we look in the Calabash because Calabash is very similar to Frank. They're pretty much identical. Um, the Calabash is basically, that's what we're looking for to transfer our test in the future, uh, migrate all of them from Robotium to Calabash. And we'll start doing that by um, already converting end-to-end -end test, uh, functional test for Android. Um, and because we also have a pipeline uh, for the native apps as well, just like for the mobile web, uh, we uh, try to solve our stubbing solution with a tool uh, called VCR. And it's not a joke, it's like regular VCR. It records live responses into the cassettes, which you can replay later. And this is our stubbing solution. It's open source, you can find it easily. Well, you can Google it. It's a great tool uh, for the testing native apps um, if you need a stubbing solution. Okay, so if, if you already probably noticed, guys, that we are big fans of open source tools in Expedia because they're simply free. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people contributing to them. And, but unfortunately, uh, all of them has an issues. Um, so some of you using the uh, um, Selenium web driver, either on iPhone or desktop browser like Chrome, Firefox, and um, maybe on Android, but if, because we're mobile, obviously, we're dealing with the mobile clients. So specifically for the um, Android Selenium web driver, we found interesting issue. We never tried to uh, test HTTPS pages. Uh, and um, uh, there is invalid certificate on your live test environment. Um, your driver will basically get stuck. You're going to get blank page, and it, that's it. It's a failure. <laughs> so we, uh, this, the workaround was basically generate uh, the certificate uh, on the regular Chrome browser and then imported it to the um, real device. And it worked very well. Um, another problem with the Android uh, Selenium web driver we encountered was the drop down boxes or drop down options, they call them, right? So we couldn't solve the problem because the Selenium driver couldn't help, uh, couldn't handle that. Um, so we use the jQuery uh, as the hacky solution, and it works up to date. So uh, we use a sim launcher. It's a Ruby a lightweight server to start our IES simulator before we start executing Selenium test. And the problem was that uh, that particular framework uh, uh, didn't have the um, flexibility to rotate the simulator while you do act test execution. So one of our engineers in London actually uh, contributed, he wrote Apple script to add that functionality. So whenever we run your, uh, whenever we run our Selenium uh, uh, test, we can rotate simulator and see how our responsive design will render um, our uh, mobile web application in the, in the web view. <clears throat> And so basically, th those problems are related, obviously, to the uh, Selenium web driver, both on AS and Android. Now, on the Frank, uh, which uh, we use to test our uh, native app on AS client, uh, we just couldn't figure out how we're going to uh, collect the logs if the application crashes, right? So what we use is a third-party uh, framework, um, Crashlytics, which is not free, but it's great. It gives you a lot of, uh, and so probably only framework is not free we're using. But it gives you great uh, information and logs. It's free now. It's free now. Here we go. Awesome. Uh, so Crashlytics uh, enables us to uh, get the logs and crash logs, as well as networking uh, data to analyze if the application crashes. And uh, we also use the plist body I put here. It's basically um, uh, when we are uh, doing, besides debugging, we try to collect uh, analytic data. We use plist body to change the configuration of application in the runtime. It helps also uh, to do more like um, I would say analytic logging and uh, testing uh, in that matter. And finally, I've been mentioning Cucumber many times for those who, have, who haven't seen that before. This is the scenario written in Gerhim language in the Cucumber format, which is, if you guys look at the screen, it's very English-oriented, readable. It supports multiple languages. English is not the only language. The power of this is that you, you write your test in the business logic as your acceptance criteria. And then all the parameterization, all the parameters, you don't have to hard code into your code like we used to do with the unit test frameworks. 
everything is here. This is the text file, right? And if you can uh, look at this uh, specific scenario where we try to uh, test the hotel search against multiple countries in the Seattle area and make sure the image is there. If you want to just expand the number of countries you want to test, I mean localization, um, if you want to change the Seattle to New York, um, you can, it, it can be done here. It gives us a flexibility and scalability, meaning that we are flexible in terms of adding, uh, changing test on the flight without looking at the code. It can be done by non-technical people like project managers, QAs, developers at any time. The call is three amigos, right? And another thing, it's a live document. It replaces the old test cases and old test suites. So we do not, in Expedia Mobile, we do not have any test cases. We do not have test suites. Cucumber, uh, the call them feature files, are replacing those. Can you guys start the video? So right now, this is the live demo of uh, how we execute our mobile web tests in parallel. It's important uh, to have running tests in parallel for the speed uh, of uh, the pipeline, right? You want to get coverage as fast as you can. And this is UI tests, which are slow. They are the largest tests that go end to end. And you want to execute them as many clients as possible. Here on the demo, you can see this both the iOS simula iPhone simulator and Android simulator running the exactly same test. But what you don't see on this demo that we do in real lab, we're running against real devices on mobile web. So this is a great example that parallelization saves you tons of time, which you will need uh, if you want to um, implement the continuous integration into your, uh, into your department, into your company. This is the sweetest part of automation when you see this working. I think it's two minute video. <laughs> Once. We just basically kick the both tests. They are not starting all the time at the same time. The Jenkins control that. So for the purpose of the demo, we recorded both back to back simulators started at the same time. But they could be like delayed, but it depends on the check in. They're triggered uh, automatically. Okay, so let's go. Next one. Okay, Web Build Radiator is a Jenkins plugin that we're using at Expedia to monitor the health of the pipeline and the real time. This is the tool uh, that helps us basically to, to spot the failure right away and to jump on it and make sure the developers fix it as soon as possible. Because to mention 10 minutes period, it's pretty fast. That's why visual representation is very important. I'm sure that probably most of you have been in a situation where you are running your test and there's a failure and nobody look at it for a day at least, right? So these radiators are running on a big screen TVs around the office and you'll see the video in a, in a few minutes where you're going to see that how it helps to visualize the health of your pipeline. It's really important. And the red color is basically a representation of failure which, you know, track attention right away if, if there is one. So this is the, we call it web test radiator. Uh, this is not plugin, it's just Confluence page where we are basically representing the graphs from different Jenkins job to see overall picture of a product. So this is the mobile website that we're using right now currently for the mobile hotels. And you can see on the left side, the uh, graph is much greener than on the right side is because it runs against stop data and mock data. On the right side, the test running against the uh, live services, which is a test environment, but still live services, which undergo a lot of changes during the day, and that's why it's much more redder. So when you are building a pipeline, it's important to have both. 
and see what's going on with live services and stop data. <clears throat> okay, let's play the second video. It's self-exploratory. <laughs> after lunch, right, <laughs> to wake you up. So yes, this is exactly what we do. A responsive to the failures during the execution. You see what happened, developer check in stale code, broke the test, QA, look at it. And it's not necessarily QA. Sometimes the project manager, even the director of the whole team comes, so you were why the radiator is red. So it's very important that it's actually the whole team participate in the process. And if they spot the failure, they react to this, fix it, and it's green again. And before I give my turn back to Kostyup, I just want to make two key notes. What I learned for the past year, what's important in order to be successful in terms of Im uh, embedded test automation and continuous delivery, is you always have to plan ahead. Always plan your testing, either it's BDD test, functional test, or integration test, at least a week or two weeks before you start a sprint. Especially if you're an agile company, it's very important. Besides that, it's very important to understand what kind of test you will put into the pipeline. Not all the tests go there. Be very selective. It cannot be large. For those tests that you think are the one that is a good candidate for the automation for the pipeline, always make sure you consult with developers. Ask a second opinion. Talk to the project manager if it's good for the product. And for those tests that will be like for uh, more like uh, integration environment or any other live environments that will take longer time, like large tests for two hours or three hours execution, put them there. Make sure you segregate, right? It's very important. And now Kastu will wrap it up. Yep. So just a quick recap of some of the benefits we have seen from doing this. Uh, just, this is just last couple of years. Um, we have increased our Java releases. Uh, content releases can go out every day, right? But Java releases are hardcore changes that can break a lot of things. We have increased that almost four times. Um, the typical regression, like I said, you check in a bug. Oftentimes, it takes a day to find the bug, a day to find, uh, like, fix it and verify it. Well, with this new system, you just saw in a matter of minutes, there was the, the code got checked in, something broke, we noticed it, we fixed it, moved on, right? So worst case scenario, when we have massive breaks, maybe four hours to fix the whole thing end to end. But a lot of the time, it's, it's been minutes that we can get issues fixed. Um, 
we run hundreds and hundreds of stub regression runs every day uh, that find all kinds of issues. And when you combine the number of regression you run with how quickly they get fixed, it really enables you to do continuous delivery. Just from my team standpoint, like uh, the testing time we have saved by doing this is in the order of magnitude of 40%. So something that used to take us five, six, seven days to test and ship, you're doing it like two days or less. And that's helping us move faster, get more agile. And obviously the obvious one is the moment you have automation, you can run it on multiple devices in parallel. So we have four times the device coverage we have today than what we had a year ago. And as the number of devices in the industry are scaling, you really need a solution like that, that you can just keep scaling more and more devices. That's it, guys. Questions? Thank Great. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I learned a lot. All I need to do uh, mobile testing at Expedia is a cucumber, a radiator, and some Velcro to stick my phones on a wall. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> Okay. In all seriousness, uh, if you have questions, please do line up at the mics. Um, I'll take some questions off the moderator here. Um, and uh, let's see. First question up. Did you find automated test in a different language, Ruby, than your application? Oh, wow, this one is hard to parse. It says, did you find automated tests in a, language, in a different language, Ruby, then your application limits developers collaboration on tests. Wow. I, I'll take that. Um, so we made a very conscious decision here. Last year, when we were picking Selenium, we knew we could run it with either Ruby or Java. And we said we'll go with Ruby, although all our devs are really good at Java. Um, in fact, it was the developers who came and told us, you know, Ruby is a scripting language, works much, much better for automated tests as compared to Java, which can be a little lot heavier. Um, so it was in collaboration with devs where we said, okay, what is the right tool to use? And we agreed on using Ruby. Has it limited the collaboration? Absolutely not. We have our devs writing Ruby tests all the time. I just got an email yesterday saying a new dev uh, that joined checked in 75 new tests that are now running in the pipeline. So I think uh, the devs are actually really part of the solution here is collaborate with them and find what tool is right for you. Great, thank you. All right, so we have uh, two live questions, so I think you got here first. Um, you can say your name, your company if you want, and your question, any piece that you'd like. Hi, I'm Chris McMahon with uh, Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, I'd like to ask you about um, enthusiasm for creating feature files in Cucumber. How do you build enthusiasm? Do you have enthusiastic contributors for your uh, scenarios? And how big of a backlog of scenarios and feature files do you keep at any given time? So I'll answer that question. Um, when I started, uh, I was the only enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have a full support from developers. And uh, I think uh, think about that as a living organism, right? You have to infect everybody on the team like a parasite <laughs> and make sure that people all get the disease of cucumber, right? And then what happened is a year later, right now, everybody writing this. Let me give you a good example, project managers write an acceptance criteria in the sprint in a Cucumber format. Then developers and QA pick this up, massage it out, make it look clean and nice, and put it uh, Ruby logic uh, into a page object model, and uh, all tests become live. So it, it, I mean, in my opinion, it's only successful tool that when everybody's using it. Everybody means everyone on the team. If it's only the QAs, you will fail. Does that answer your question? We will. The, the statement was, let's take this offline later. Absolutely. Um, just so it's on the mic. OK. Um, I will, there's one more live. OK, there's live questions sat down. Uh, I got, guess they got their questions answered. We'll go to the, uh, the moderator here. Uh, does testing mobile web apps on real devices find more bugs than testing on a desktop browser resized um, with fake user agents? Um, actually, it's a good question. Um, sometimes we have to test in real browsers, and a good example is a Facebook Connect. So Facebook login feature for Expedia, um, because of the limitation of Android uh, Selenium web driver and iOS Selenium web driver, uh, we, cannot, we couldn't uh, launch the new window um, to test that functionality. So we used the Chrome with the iPhone user agent where we actually did some resizing. Uh, to test the responsive design, and also we're able to launch the new login page for the Facebook. 
So yes, we actually we try to use a, a lot of open source tools lately just to solve problems around the driver. So I'll wait for the APM talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the, just to quickly add, yes, I think there's a, there's a place for both. You we want to use uh, Chrome with user agent strings, but you also want to use simulators and also real devices. It's, there's no one size fits all. You'll have to do all three because they find different types of bugs. I agree. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so here's a, a hot question that's been popping up further and further on the uh, interest list. It says, does testing mobile apps, um, sorry, actually somebody just, it just got itself to go down. Um, was the UI demo run with mocked data? Um, is your deployment to prod automatic or is it gated with uh, manual intervention? So how much automation do you have? Yes. And are you mac mocking out your data? So um, the, the reason why we focus the talk on the test automation piece is because we haven't fully flushed out the continuous deployment piece. Uh, what I do know is that you know we it used to take us seven days to do a manual test run with uh, with all the different languages. Now it takes one day. So there is manual intervention, but it's like significantly lower. And one of the things that we did was we take screenshots as the app runs, and we we push them automatically to our localization team who are the experts in the UI, they look at that and we get feedback in less than 24 hours. So you, we are also using automation to speed up the, the loc verification process. Yeah, nice. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more question, so we'll take the live question right over here. Hi, uh, my name is Arthur Liu. I work for ITA Software by Google. Thank you for being such a great customer. Uh, I see that uh, in Cucumber you have product manager writing the test definition, well, the test objective in free form at the beginning of the test, and then you have a test engineer come and write the test itself. Uh, over time, with such a large body of tests, how do you manage the test drifting from the definition? So uh, we, we have a regression plan, right? And we keep that up to date. Whenever a new uh, feature changes, uh, part of the, the job of the, the QA engineer is to go and update the existing tests that are there and also deprecate tests. We, we routinely go in and even deprecate tests that are no longer like valid. So it's um, it, the good thing is you don't have to go to a document and update the test plan now. You're actually updating your live automation, right? So which means that it's going to get run. If it sits there, you have a choice. Either it has to pass or you have to remove it so that you know it's no longer applicable to the feature. So it's it's part of the sprint development process to go and update that. And we use tagging for that. It helps a lot. We create different profiles. Yeah, we have tags, right? Very nice. Um, so thank you, Kostub. Thank you, Igor. Um, and if you guys want to suggest a topic table tomorrow, it sounds like Cucumber is going to be a hot topic. So, sure. yeah. so thank you. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Thank you.